Composer who registers, as we're about to hear, loss and shock with a very different kind of power is the Russian composer Dmitry Shostakovich. Um, many of you will know that his Leningrad symphony, his seventh symphony, was actually written, partly written, at least two movements of it were written, while Shostakovich was still in the city of Leningrad, which was cut off by the invading German armies for two and a half years. And in the first year of the siege in 1941, a million people died, either of malnutrition or of extreme cold, because as it would happen, this was also the coldest winter in Petersburg, Leningrad, for 100 years. The temperature was minus 45 for several days. People, uh, German soldiers outside the city froze to death standing up. Um, people in the city found eventually that it was no warmer in the houses than it was outside, and so they stood together in the street, huddled together to listen to Radio Leningrad played on speakers in the street. Um, Shostakovich's Leningrad Symphony was eventually performed in the still besieged city. Quite an achievement. I saw the manuscript of the Leningrad Symphony recently, and there are the first movement, there are these little circular symbols at regular, more or less regular points throughout the movement. I remember asking the curator, what are those? Um, and uh, he said that this was Shostakovich's mother had written these on the score whenever there was an air raid and they had to run for the cover. So he'd actually indicated in the score where these air raids took place. I met an extraordinary old man by the name of Viktor Kozlov, who had played clarinet in that siege performance of the Leningrad Symphony. In fact, he was with the Red Army, he was a clarinetist with the Red Army band, and he, Sergeant Major called him and said, Kozlov, get your clarinet, you're going to be dropped into Leningrad to play a symphony, which surprised him. When he got there, he found that half the orchestra had died of malnutrition, most of them were too weak to play, to particularly to blow for more than 10 minutes at a time. So they had to have special diets flown in and uh, to take aerobic exercise to get them up to the point of doing this. Um, I remember talking to him and his wife, who was also there in the city at the time. At the end of the interview, I asked one of those slightly pat questions. I said, when you hear this music today, does it still have the same effect on you? And I remember him well, I remember a sort of a wave of emotion hitting the room, and both he and his wife just started sobbing. I remember he seized my arm, and I remember him saying, Nie moshna gavrit, nie moshna gavrit. It's not possible to say, it's not possible to say. And, well, certainly a powerful testimony to how music, it would seem under the circumstances, played an astonishing part in not just registering the shock of the impact of conflict, but in helping people to find the strength to survive and overcome it. It is extraordinary. People argue these days about whether Shostakovich was thinking of Hitler or Stalin as the chief destroyer of Leningrad. I think that's a bit academic when you're in the midst of a situation where you're starving to death and being shelled all the time. The question of who's ultimately responsible is maybe not quite as important as the question of just surviving. And um, that certainly seems to be a role that Shostakovich's Seventh Symphony played brilliantly in the course of the war. But it's quite interesting to compare what happened to the next symphony, the eighth. Shostakovich wrote this in 1943, um, after, not long after the, the, the end of the Battle of Stalingrad. And in fact, people at the wild time thought that it may have a Stalingrad connection. Um, and yet what's fascinating to me is that this symphony, which it seems far more than the Leningrad, tries to express elements of destruction, elements of shock, horror, brutalization, and grief, is one which could not, it seems, be heard in the mood of post-war trauma, maybe, or whatever, at the end of World War II. The symphony was denounced and Shostakovich along with it. He was called a bourgeois formalist, which is the worst, one of the worst things you could be in those days, enemy of the people. Uh, here's a um, composer called Vladimir Zakharov reacting to the symphony. I consider that from the point of view of the people, the Eighth Symphony can in no way be called a musical composition. It is a composition which has absolutely no connection with the art of music, which reminds me, may we have way that some of us might have felt listening to that improvisation yesterday, that extraordinary improvisation uh, by the traumatized person that we were played. Um, which raises a fascinating question. If music expresses something as powerfully as that does, is it actually therefore a good piece of music, however much it may fly in the face of our aesthetic criteria? 
Shostakovich expresses extraordinarily, I think, in the Eighth Symphony, something of what it is to live through an experience like the invasion that the Russians experienced, the massive destruction they experienced in World War II. But was it indeed too much, or was Russia not ready for what it was that he had to express? Was this why there was such an angry reaction to this music? Is there, is there a time to bear witness and a time to wait to bear witness? That's something we're going to come back to in a moment. This kind of music, seer clearly, it seems, is involved in that trauma. There doesn't seem to be much doubt about it. The regular, repetitive, rhythmic, machine-like, war machine-ness of the third movement, and then the explosion, the cathartic outpouring of horror and grief at the beginning of the fourth. I better move on very quickly to my last extract. Benjamin Britten's War Requiem. Benjamin Britten, of course, great friend of Shostakovich, and a lot in common. The remarkable, I wish I could say more about it, but this, one of the most extraordinary things about the War Requiem is the way that Brayton synthesizes or draws together the poetry of Wilfred Owen, the great first World War poet, and the words of the Latin mass. Again and again, he finds extraordinary correspondences between the subjects of poem, Owen's often despairing poetry and the words of the Requiem rite. But the section which, for me, I think is most remarkable comes at the end of the final movement, the Liberame, Free Me, O Lord, um, Britain takes Owen's poem, Strange Meeting, a poem he was writing at his death. In fact, the poem is incomplete, where two soldiers meet each other in hell and realize that they've been killed in battle. And the words, the poem ends with the words, let us sleep now, with an extraordinary bit of musical grafting. Britain follows that with the words of the final prayer of the Requiem Mass, well, not from the Requiem Mass, but from the Requiem, where the coffin is carried out of the church and the priest sends the deceased on his way in paradisum. May they be received into paradise, or may he be received into paradise. This is a truly extraordinary moment where, for a moment, it seems, there is an answer to the prayer, let us sleep now. But even that also is followed, as with Beethoven, by dissonance. The dissonance is on the bells. The big question mark still lingers. Hope, possibility of reconciliation, dissonance rarely contained, I think, so beautifully in one single musical statement. That great vision of hope and then the dissonant sounds. Wonderful, as with Beethoven, the possibility and the doubt held, I think, concurrently. I don't know what it is that that music does that is so important, but it does. There is something in the image of hope and at the same time doubt that it presents us with so radiantly that is in some important sense part of how human beings can maybe come to terms with the legacy of their own will to conflict. But that is absolutely the end of my time allowance here.